What a powerful name it is. Amen. Amen. Everybody just say Jesus. Jesus. Everybody say Jesus. Jesus. What a powerful, powerful name it is. Nothing compares to him. Nothing can stand against him. It has always been about him. It will always be about him. It is about him tonight. It is about Jesus. It is the name of Jesus. Everybody, one more time, say Jesus. Jesus. We are glad you are here for Insight 17. Thank you for being here. I really am honored that you would be here. This is our fifth year, by the way, fifth year of Insight 17. And I guess I'm just curious, how many of you have been here all five years? Just show of hands. That's a good, that's a good number. How many of you have been here three years, two or three years? Come on, two or three years. All right, that's a good number. What's up, balcony people? What's up? How many of y'all, how many of y'all, we've gone to the balcony this year. How many of y'all have been here? This is your first year. Give it up for all of you. Welcome them. Welcome them. Hey, as, as our team started thinking about insight, we decided and just really felt the Holy Spirit impressing upon us that it was time to redefine success. Many of you, like me, you've been to Christian conferences over the years, and the truth is you've kind of heard some of the same themes over and over and over. And sometimes it just, to be honest with you, if I can be real here for a moment, it just kind of gets on my nerves a little bit. Sometimes you go and it's, you know, five steps to a perfect marriage. Who believes that five steps can put you in a perfect marriage? <laughs> Come on! Right, And there's all these things, and sometimes it's just formulaic, and sometimes I just don't know. And so we decided, you know what, it is time to do a conference and actually redefine success, to think carefully about what is on the dashboard of our vocational, if you're a leader in the marketplace, you're a leader in the church, whatever the case may be, to start to define and redefine what is success. And I wanna just talk to you today about exactly that. And to get us into the topic today, and I've been going to Christian conferences now for like 20 years. I've never heard in a main session, I've never heard a main session at a conference about the topic that I'm going to talk to you about tonight. And I would venture to guess that if you go to Christian conferences, you've probably never heard this either. And to get us into the topic, I want to ask you a question. It's quite, you don't need to answer out loud. This is between you and the Lord. What is your most valuable possession? Go ahead and open up your booklet and, and find where we are there. And, and, and I think that question is listed there for you. If not, you can write it down. What is the most valuable possession you have? Oh, and by the way, if you're struggling to, to figure that out, here's a, here's a clue. Your, mo <laughs> your most valuable possession is the thing that you absolutely go ballistic over when someone damages it or someone messes with your thing, you have a tendency to go ballistic. A few weeks ago, I was with my boys. I got four boys. I was with my boys and we, we were down at the beach and we were in a traffic jam and you'd go a few feet and then you'd stop. You'd go a few feet and then you'd stop. And all of a sudden, all uh, five of us are in this uh, suburban. All of a sudden, a car, bam, hits us right in the back. Joshua, who's on the front row with me tonight, 11 years old, goes, oh, dad, my neck's hurting. Why are you laughing? What if he was hurt? No, I'm just kidding. And I said, really, Josh? He goes, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I jumped out of the car and the guy came to me and he goes, man, I'm so sorry. It's obviously my fault. I am so sorry. I said, oh, sorry, man, don't worry about it. He goes, no, really, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I said, sorry. We had to wait a long time for the cops to get about another five minutes. He, I'm sorry, man, I'm so sorry. It's my fault. Finally, I got tired of the guy apologizing. So I just said, hey, man, I don't care. It's a rental car. He goes, oh, well, then no worries. <laughs> what is your most valuable possession? I want to tell you what God says and the Bible says is your most valuable possession, and you might not even realize it, and you might not believe me. Your most valuable possession, that's not going to work. Your most valuable possession is your soul. Your most valuable possession is your what leaders? It's your what? 
It's your soul. And the truth is, most of us don't believe that or we don't really live into that because we don't really go ballistic when it starts to get damaged. That's why the Bible says this, only be careful and watch over your souls. What, what? Only be careful and watch over your souls closely. I wanna just jump right in tonight with, with not a lot of wasted time. Here's the reality. Your soul is running your life. Your soul is enlivening or not, integrating or not all the areas of your life that enable you to become a healthy whole being or not. Again, as most of you know, well, you all know because uh, the, the host said it earlier, I'm on sabbatical. And um, I am talking to you tonight really about what God has been doing in my life. I can only deliver to you what is fresh on my life. It's always been that way. I have to teach in the moment. So really what I'm trying to serve up tonight is what God has been showing on the plate of my life. It is about the soul. And what I wanna to talk to you about tonight is redefining success with Sabbath rest. Redefining success with Sabbath rest. Rest. Why don't you say that with me, if you will? Ready? Go. Redefining success with Sabbath rest. Wow, you sound great tonight. Let's pray. Father, I thank you. I thank you for all of those gathered here tonight. Thank you for their unique stories. Thank you for their callings, their ministries, their families. Father God, I pray that you would set apart, consecrate the next 30 minutes or so so that every single person within the sound of my voice can hear a fresh word from you. I pray, God, that we would take inventory of our souls tonight. I pray we would reflect on the condition of that inner place, that space you refer to in your word as our souls. And I pray, God, that we would leave here tonight more in tune with you more in tune with your desires for us and how we might learn the rhythms of your grace. How we might better care, Father God, for the totality of our lives. Not just what we do out there, Lord God, in the public square or within our ministry departments or standing on preaching platforms or the grind of our marketplace endeavors, but rather tonight, Lord God, let us jump off of the treadmill of success as the world defines it. May we learn from you. May we learn from you how to truly care for our souls. Move me out of the way, Lord God. Let your people hear from you this day. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Go and open up your Bibles to the book of Exodus. We're gonna be looking at different passages of scripture, but if you wanna just find a place to land, that's a really good place for you to land. I wanna to talk to you about redefining success through Sabbath rest. And I don't know if you've already thought about this or you thought about it recently, but like Sabbath rest made it in God's top 10. Have you ever thought about that? I mean, God's got a top 10 list, right? You know this, right? It's the 10 commandments. And in the 10 commandments, we come across things like Thou shall not murder. Thou shall not steal. Thou shall not commit adultery. I mean, we would all agree, right? Those are major sins, correct? Thou shall not do all the, and then we were going, yeah, amen, amen. And then all of a sudden, oh, oh, by the way, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy and do no work on it. And we're like, how in the world did that make its way into God's Top 10. Let's just read it. Exodus 20, 8 and 10. We like to read scripture together at New Hope Church, so we're going to read it out loud. Ready? Go. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it, by keeping it what? All right, let's continue. Six days you should labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not. Stop right there. On it you shall what? Not. It, it doesn't say take and form a committee and vote by Robert's rules of order. 
No, no, thou shall not, let's continue, do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your manservant or your maidservant, nor your animals, nor the aliens within your gate. Notice we are to remember the Sabbath and we are to keep it holy. Did you notice how the Bible said though, keep it holy? Keep it holy by ceasing all forms of work. Notice there is this six to one ratio. For six days, we are to get on the treadmills of our lives and go to work. How many of you like treadmills? How many of you get on them regularly? How many of you have ever just did a face plant on a treadmill? I thought about showing you some videos, but I'm gonna spare you. Go online, YouTube, and just Google treadmill disasters. <laughs> treadmill, let's get a little faster here. Have you ever noticed how life just gets busier and busier and busier? Have you noticed how life just continues to get louder and louder and louder? Have you noticed how life gets more and more violent. And what ends up happening, what I have done many, many times in my life is I have not remembered the Sabbath and I just get faster and faster. How fast should I get going tonight? <laughs> faster and faster and faster. Harvard did some research recently where they studied humanity in America. Let me, let me give you some stats that'll blow your mind. Of the people who regularly said they are experiencing physical and or psychological symptoms caused by stress, 77%. Here's another one. Feel they are living with extreme, I mean extreme stress, 33%. They asked a group of those who feel their stress has increased, increased over the last five years, 48%. Many of them cited money and work as the leading cause of their stress. How many of you would agree? Work and money. This number reported lying awake at night due to stress. 48%. And on top of that, we live in a culture now where the hottest toy on the market is the freaking fidget spinner. I tell you, I was in the gym the other day. I'm not making this up. I was in the gym the other day and there was a guy on the treadmill playing with a fidget spinner. <laughs> like my kids can take this bad boy and put it on their nose and stuff like that. There is this ratio in the Bible, a six to one ratio, whereby God's word says to us, for six days, you get on the treadmill and you strive, and you create, and you produce, and you gather, and you acquire success, whatever that looks like for you. But one day a week, one day a week, you are to get off the treadmill. That is a really comfortable chair. <laughs> I don't know where they got this chair from. <sighs> wow. Glory to God. <laughs> and you get off of the treadmill and you breathe in the rhythms of God's grace and you remember the Sabbath up there with God's top 10. You remember the Sabbath, and you keep it holy. And that looks different for many of us, right? I understand that. We're not gonna make it formulaic tonight. But you make it holy by ceasing your work and honoring God. And God takes care of your most valuable possession which again is what? 
It is your soul. Have you noticed how hectic this world is getting and being so available in our lives and making ourselves start to believe the false illusion that, that we are more important than we actually are. I mean, we do that. We start to convince ourselves that we are more important. We think that I might be needed, so I need to be available. Well, maybe so, but there's something else we need to know about this unceasing and spiritual and emotional and physical availability. It is killing us. And if you're a pastor, I hope you've been taking some serious soul inventory in the last year as we've heard from the likes and seen the likes of Pete Wilson leading one of the greatest churches in our nation resign, Perry Noble leading a church from my home state of like 30,000 people who wrote a book you might recall about two years ago called Overwhelmed, interestingly enough, started drinking, started having a problem with drinking, got fired from his church. And if you watch Facebook at all, you saw this past week, he did a Facebook live video. It's, it's probably close to millions of views already. It was just like on Tuesday of this week. And the title of the Facebook live video was this, the day I decided to kill myself. And Perry's showing up here tomorrow. I gotta say something. I hope when he walks in that door, he'll find one of the most gracious communities of believers and followers. Don't ever let us become a, a people who shoot our wounded. That's totally a sign. I didn't even plan on saying that. But it's killing us pastor or workplace leader or, or a parent who works in the home, it is absolutely killing us. Wayne Muller, who was a Harvard professor who specializes in working with people in addictions and abuses, said this, how did we get so terribly lost in a world saturated with striving and grasping? yet somehow bereft or lacking, right, of joy and delight. I would suggest it is this, he says. We have forgotten the Sabbath. How's your soul? How's your practice of Sabbath rest? And where in the world, right, did Moses come up with this? Well, you don't have to look very far. Moses is reflecting upon the creation story, Genesis 2. He says in Exodus 20, 11, as he's reflecting on the creation story, he says, for in six days, the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them. But he, he what? He rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it what? God, God rested on the seventh day. The fact that it's in the Ten Commandments is mirroring that which we see in the creation story. Here's the point before we dig deep into this concept of the soul, because I know it's kind of a nebulous, esoteric kind of theory. How do we even put our minds and wrap our arms around the word soul? We're going to go there. But here's the point on the front end. The Bible demonstrates right out of the gate and God puts on full display for all to see the all-important practice of soul Sabbath. And he says, follow my example. Hey, come on, can I, just, can I just keep it real tonight? How arrogant is it of me? Because like, like, listen, leaders, I... That's what sabbatical's teaching me. I've struggled with this practice far more than I've succeeded at this practice. How arrogant is it of me to think that I don't need to rest 
when my God, my heavenly father created in six days and it was a pretty beautiful creation, wouldn't you say? And then he rested. Here's a question. And I put it in the first person so that you could really, really reflect on this. How am I doing with the biblical practice of soul Sabbath? Here's another question that I, I really want to ask you and I'll keep coming back to tonight. How is my soul? God would then raise up a prophet, right, by the name of Isaiah. And Isaiah would say this in Isaiah 58. He says, let's, let's read this out loud. You did it so well last time. Ready? Go. If you call the Sabbath a delight and the Lord's holy day honorable... And if you honor it by not going your own way and not doing as you please or speaking idle words, then you will find your, you'll find your what? The Bible links soul care, Sabbath rest with joy and delight in the Lord. Six days, go get it, go get it, tear it up, create, produce, gather. But one day, step off of it and rest. Now, the last thing I wanna do tonight is put you on a guilt trip for not observing Sabbath. Oh, wow, you were already there, weren't you? Guys, I didn't come back to do that. I really didn't. And some of you, probably, probably 90% of you have already thought this. Well, it's easy for you to talk about this, buddy. You've been on sabbat sabbatical. Sabbat sabbatical. <laughs> wow, Sabbath, Sabbath, sabbatical, right? No. I don't want to put you on a guilt trip. I just want to share with you what God's been teaching me. And I want to encourage you to get back to what God's word says to us about this practice. So to understand this, because again, a guilt trip never really gets us anywhere. To understand this, we actually have to camp out for a moment on the layers of our lives, the complexities of our lives. Lives. And let me, just, let me just show you this. Take out your booklet. There's a place for you to turn to a, a blank page. I think it even says the whole human being or something like that. You, I want you to do some artwork with me tonight. I want you to try to draw something out with me. I'm going to try to actually sketch out the layers, the complexities of our lives so that we understand the role that the soul makes in our lives. And by the way, I need to give credit where credit is due. John Ortberg and Dallas Willard have impacted me greatly in this area. The first thing we want to talk about is your and my will. Our will. Our willpower, if you will. If you're taking notes, you might also draw like a little heart there. Because this is that this is that area in your life, that deep area, that heart area, that willpower area of your life. We talk about this in terms of your heart, in terms of your spirit. Often you hear about it in this day and age as your willpower, right? And most of us have had unfortunate experiences with our willpower, right? Like, like how many of you had New Year's resolutions this past January, don't lie, you're in the house of the Lord. <laughs> okay, good many of you. How's that working out for you? And the people who didn't raise their hands, you've given up on New Year's resolutions, right? <laughs> Me too, right? I think this past year, my New Year's resolution was to have no New Year's resolutions. We've all had that experience. The second area that you want to think about in terms of the layers or the complexities of your life is the mind, the mind. 
And the mind, I'm going to write down here, the mind is where uh, you have your thoughts. Jot that down there. The mind is where you have feelings, right? You have thoughts and feelings. All, all thoughts, there are feelings associated with your thoughts, and there are thoughts associated with your feelings. It's, it's the mind area. It's, it's where our thoughts reside, the next very, very important layer in this is your body. Write it down. It is your body. Now, when you start to think about your body, this is where you have things like your habits, right? It's where you have things like your appetites, okay? This is, this is oh, and by the way, this is a very important point to know. Make note of this. Your your body, interestingly enough, is the range of your effective will, okay? It's really hard to lead well without understanding this concept. The body is where the will can be in control. In fact, it is the area in which you see the will or your willpower or your lack thereof control manifest itself within your body, and this is why it is so hard to overcome sinful habits or dangerous appetites. Repetitive sin or addictions are when appetites overpower your will. Willpower is never enough. That's why this conversation is so very important. Some of you have been struggling with things for so many years over and over and over. And this message tonight, if we understand it right and we start to get the soul right, we'll start to see an integration, a unity, an alignment. Sin and addictions and damaging appetites Eat willpower for lunch every day of the week and twice on Sunday. This is where we tend to struggle. Quick, quick story. I know a pastor who went into the office one day and everybody on his staff knew that he had a major addiction to chocolate-covered glazed donuts. <laughs> Glory, hallelujah. Hallelujah. And it was around January, and he was making his New Year's resolution, so he told his staff, because he wanted to be held accountable, he said, hey, I need you guys to hold me accountable. I know you like when I bring those donuts in. I'm no longer going to bring those donuts in. I have to stop eating the chocolate-covered glazed donuts. He made it a week. He made it two weeks. He made it three weeks. But around the fourth week, he came walking into the office with boxes of chocolate-covered <laughs> glazed donuts. And his staff gathered around him and said, no, what are you doing? You told us to hold you accountable. Don't, you can't do that. He goes, oh, no, I got this, I got this. He goes, on the way into the church today, I prayed, I prayed, I prayed. And I prayed that the Lord would let me have chocolate-covered, glazed donuts. And he said, the Lord told me that if I go to the donut shop and I find a parking place right in front of the donut shop, no, 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 it is of his will. And he paused and he said, on the fifth lap around the parking lot, <laughs> a spot opened right in front. <laughs> this is where your good habits or your bad habits, your good appetites or your bad appetites manifest themselves in and through your body. Lastly, there's one other very important layer that we need to talk about. And most people don't think about this when they think about the, the, the totality of a human life. It is your social life. Like, it is, it is that important. It is your social life. This is where you have Friendships. This is where you're friends with your family members. This is why after you have a wonderful evening with a group of friends where you break delicious bread together and you have a wonderful evening, this is why you will hear people say things like that. Oh, that was good for my... Robert Putnam wrote a book that I read recently uh, titled Bowling Alone. 
bowling alone. And in this book, um, he showed recent research and, and data whereby if you, if you are in authentic community, you live longer than those who eat healthy. That important to have good social relationships. Again, the data shows that even if you have a poor diet, but you have authentic community and a social life, you are a healthier person. My takeaway from that is it is better to eat Twinkies in community <laughs> than broccoli all alone. <laughs> Can I get an amen? I, I, when I come back from sabbatical in September, I'm gonna talk to the Connections team. I think we need to do a brand new campaign on getting into life groups. And it's gonna say this, get into a life group or die. <laughs> How's that? <laughs> Your social life is just that important. Now check this out, don't miss this. The capacity to integrate all of these different functions, the capacity to align all of these areas of your life, the will, the mind, the body, the social life, the ability to integrate all of that is related to how well you care for your soul. Which is why God's word is crystal clear on the importance of soul Sabbath. And by the way, don't miss this. This is why Jesus said when he was asked, hey, give me the footnotes of Christianity. Boil it all down. Make it simple for me. This is why Jesus said in Mark 12, 30, love the Lord your God with all your what? Heart. With all your heart. With all your what? Soul. With all your soul. With all your what? mind and with all your, your body. And then he said this, what? And the second commandment is this, love your as yourself. Do, do you see it? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. It is the soul it is, it is the ability to allow God to do soul therapy on you that will enable you to fully integrate, live an integrated life, a holistic life, a healthy life, whereby all of these different complexities and layers of your life line up and you find unity. You find joy. You find delight. You find contentment because I don't know if you know this or not, your soul was intended to be satisfied. It was intended to be satisfied in God. And when we get Sabbath rest right, we will see that our soul starts to integrate all of these different areas and our relationships with God and our relationships with one another. This is why Jesus taught, by the way, he taught this, what good is it for someone to gain the entire world but lose what? Your soul. I used to think that just meant, you know what, you just, you're either going to gain the things of this world, money, possessions, and all these things, and you're just going to go to hell. So much more than that. It's about soul satisfaction. And so that you don't lose your soul you make sure your soul is healthy and then you find satisfaction and contentment and you're not caught up in the rat race of wanting more and more and more and more and more. It's kind of like this. Who's more content? Who's more content? The man who has $12 million or the man who has 12 children? The answer, 12 children because he doesn't want any more. Think about it. <laughs> the integration of these things are so, so important. 
Some of you will remember an, uh, an old-fashioned word that used to be used for the word pastor. Let me speak to the pastors for just a moment. It's the word curate. Curate, curate, C-U-R-A-T-E. You've heard that. You hear it in foreign land, lands. You don't, you don't hear it much around here anymore. Do you know what the word curate literally means? It means someone who watches over the souls of people. Pastors, you know what I'm learning? Ministry leaders, marketplace leaders, leaders in your home who you feel God has called you to look over the souls of your children. I've learned that I can't look over people's souls as a pastor unless my soul is healthy. I was, I was on a plane recently and I was working on this message and I was, I was going away. I never pay attention to what they say. You know, you've been there. And, but the, 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 air, the uh, airplane uh, employee staff, they were giving their little spiel and they got to that point where they talked about if the oxygen mask drops down, right? Put it on yourself first before you put it on someone else, even your children. And I've always thought, that is stupid. If I'm with my children, I'm putting them on, you know, the mask on them first. And for that moment, I think I heard that message afresh and anew. And I was working on this message and I thought, there it is. I can't, I can't care for the souls of others unless I first care for my own soul. I stand before you today, not as one who has always aced this. For those of you who know me, you know that I can go, I can go long and hard. And I'm looking at some of you and you can too. Task oriented, type A, driven people. We struggle with this. And again, I'm not here to put you on a guilt trip. I'm here to share with you the, the learning curve that I've been experiencing in my own life as for the last five years, not just during the sabbatical, but the staff around here can tell you, for the last five years, I've been on this journey of starting to understand the need to go hard. Never, never want to second guess that. Go hard for God. But rest hard for God. I've actually realized it's hard work to rest. <laughs> Think about it. It's hard work to rest. You know what I've been discovering as I've been on the sabbatical? I've been discovering that um, I am far better at being a human doing than a human being. Like for the first I took, oh, by the way, I took Instagram. I took, I don't do Instagram. I took Facebook. I took Twitter. I took my email. I took it all off my phone. For the first two or three weeks, I was walking around with DTs. <laughs> I'd, I'd be walking around, I'd grab my phone, and then I'd look at my phone, and it's like nothing on my phone, but like you version. So I'd, I'd read the Bible, right? And it stayed off. And finally, I'm not so addicted to the phone and I'm able to practice this, this concept, this, this godly wisdom that he has given us to rest our souls. And I wish you could see what I see as I see a lot of people looking at me who desperately want this. How's your soul? How are you caring for your soul. The other day I was up and I was reading the word and it's just early in the morning. I, I like to get up early most days and I was reading and God spoke this to me. How many of you like you've, how many of you have had a surgery in the last year? Any kind of surgery, show of hands. Okay, how many of you had a surgery in the last five years? Yeah, how many of us will have a surgery in the next five years? That's probably a lot of us, right? <laughs> have you ever thought about this? A doctor can't do surgery on a patient unless the patient is still. So much so they will knock your butt out, right? <laughs> to do surgery on you. Psalm 52, 10, be still and know that I am what? If I'm over here nonstop going, 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 and I never get over here and slow her down and let the RPMs 
come back on the dashboard of my life. God, who the Bible says is the great physician, will never really be able to do soul surgery on this old boy or you. So let me just give us a few simple points of application and wrap up this first night of insight. Here's the first one. Identify your soul Sabbath day. Identify your soul Sabbath day. Put it on your calendar. Soul Sabbath. Block it off. And I'm not just talking to the pastors. I'm talking to all of us. Identify what is your day going to be. Pick a day. For most pastors, it can't be Sundays. Right? So you got to pick another day. But the Sabbath is that important for you to pick a day, block it off? Here, here's one. And by the way, I also I got to give credit where credit's due. A man by the name of Steve Smith taught me this. Light a Sabbath candle. It's just a physical reminder. I love candles. I light them all the time. But on the Sabbath day, I like to try to light one ideally in the evening. That's the, that's the Old Testament understanding of Sabbath. Starts at sundown. I light that bad boy. Don't leave it lit while I go to bed. Don't worry, I blow it out. I get up the next morning, light it and try to keep it lit all day long if I'm in the house. And it just reminds us this is the Lord's day. This is to be a holy day. I am to remember it by ceasing to work. Here's the third one. Turn off your daggum smartphone and computer. Like, turn it off. Some of you are getting DTs right now, just thinking about it. Have you noticed how obsessed our culture is with the smartphone? Can I show you a video? <laughs> this happened just a few weeks ago. I was watching this on the evening news and I'm like, oh, that's good. Um, this is one of the things I just wanna warn you. This is one of those things where you don't know whether to laugh or cry, okay? And I think it's okay to laugh. If not, I need the Lord to forgive me, okay? New York City, woman walking down the street. Check it out. Caught on camera, an accident many people have probably worried about. A woman walking down the street trips over an open door and tumbles into a basement. <laughs> it appears she was distracted by her cell phone. <laughs> CBS 2's Andrea Grimes live in Plainfield, New Jersey, where it happened shortly after noon today. Andrea. Well, Maurice, a lot of pedestrians are usually worried about perhaps falling through a sidewalk cellar door when it's closed. But in this case, it was open. A woman looking at her phone literally flipped over one of those open doors, leaving her with serious injuries. From this angle, the two wide open cellar doors look hard to miss. Surveillance video shows a PSENG crew going down to do some work. Then minutes later, the woman appears down the block, walking straight towards the cellar. Right before she gets to the open door, she looks at her phone and flips head first into the basement, about six feet below. You see two passers by stunned, and the worker in the cellar rushed towards the woman. Others on the block quickly came to look, including a police officer who happened to be across the street. I know, I told you. You don't know whether to laugh or not. And I really don't want to laugh too hard because that could be me, right? I got to, trying to give a lot of credit here tonight. I got to give credit to my wife for this. Um, she gave me and some staff members a box that says on the box, be present. And the beautiful thing about this box is that it holds your phone. And so what I try to do on the days that I'm on Sabbath, and sometimes I use it often, it just goes in there in my office near my box. But the goal is that you would take your phone. Imagine this for a moment. I know it's hard to imagine. That you would turn your phone off and you would stick it in a box like that 
and you would go, it's a beautiful thing. I'm, I'm kind of silly like this. I, I think it's good for my phone and my computer to be turned off. You know what I mean? I, I, I think our phones and our computers might need a Sabbath rest too. <laughs> uh, don't, go, don't go misquoting me. I'm not saying they got a soul. But it's good for a computer and a phone to rest for a day. Number four, I'm just giving you some practical stuff. I'm big on this, and there's some of you that might not, but this is big for me. Enjoy the great outdoors. Enjoy the great. Don't, don't let this chair draw the wrong picture. It's not, you don't, you don't, you, it's, practicing Sabbath doesn't mean you have to go sit in a chair all day long. It doesn't mean you sit on a couch and eat Doritos all day. <laughs> I got some Dorito lovers in the house. But I, I just love to get outdoors. Maybe you've heard this before. A good thing to think about is if you work with your mind, you make a living by using your mind, Sabbath with your hands, right? If you, if you, if you make a living and earn your, your keep or whatever, you work with your hands, you might do best by Sabbathing with your mind. Get outside, go fishing, garden, go for a walk, a run, whatever the case may be. But I believe the outdoors, in the outdoors, we worship and love and commune with our creator, God. Amen. Amen. Number five, engage healthy habits, good for the soul. Engage healthy habits, good for the soul the soul. And that should include, always it should include at least a part of your Sabbath in the word of God. Amen. In prayer. Those are the healthiest of all habits. But engage healthy habits good for the soul. There's an old story about the Cherokee Native American nation from right here in North Carolina, by the way. In all its wisdom, the United States government decided to move the North Carolina Native Americans from here to Oklahoma. A relentless march led by the United States Calvary began by driving the Cherokee people across rugged mountains and into the flat, dry country where they would live out their days. As the story goes, the, the colonel in charge was harsh in his treatment, forcing mothers, even mothers nursing young children, to walk miles and miles and miles every day until finally the Cherokee chief could bear it no more. And he pled passionately with the colonel, you must let us stop. Our souls need to catch up with our bodies. What a great, great quote. How's your soul? Might it need to catch up with your busy body? One of the things I've been doing this, um, this summer is um, I've been taking shag lessons with my daughter, Anna Grace. Um, I've got one girl and uh, she is the apple of my eye. And she, she called me a few months ago and she goes, hey, dad, I, ha I had this idea. W w would you be willing to take shag lessons with me? And I'm like, honey, what do you mean? I'll pay for them. I'll take them. I'll do whatever. Yes. Some of you are like, what's shag? <laughs> if you don't know what the shag is, bless your heart. The shag is the state dance of South Carolina. It's very popular here in North Carolina. It's popular all over the Southeast. But the shag dance, maybe, maybe I'll take a few steps to help you. Maybe you've seen it. But it, it's, it's really a very simple dance. You, the guy normally and, and the woman, they're holding hands like this. And you do one and two and three and four. 
one and two and three and four and then five, six. And then you go back and she's doing opposite moves of you. And then the guy is, is fully in control. The guy, after you do that a few times, he decides when he wants to spin her around this way. And so I'll be spinning my daughter around this way. Or when he wants to spin her around this way and you spin her around this way. The guy always leads the dance. Now, if you're a radical feminist, you have a problem with that. <laughs> Don't blame me. I didn't invent the dance. Okay. So I'm supposed to lead, and Anna Grace and I, we've been, we've been, we've been doing pretty well, but the problem happens when she, because she is a strong-willed young woman, when she is doing better than me, which is most of the time, and when she just wants to lead, the problem kind of happens when she starts trying to lead because it throws the entire dance off. I'm reminded of Psalm 23, right? You know it. The Lord is my, I shall not. He makes me lie down in, don't miss it, don't miss it. He leads me beside, beside what? He restores what? My soul. How's your soul. Like, I want to let you do a soul inventory this morning. I want you to really wrestle with that. In a moment, we're going to bring the lights down. And I've asked them just to create a few moments of silence for you to bow your head, quite possibly, to commune with your God and do a soul inventory. Do you need to slow down so that the soul can catch up with your busy body? Maybe the best thing that can come out of Insight 17 is not a bunch of things that you need to add to your to-do list. Maybe the best thing that can come out of Insight 17 for you is that you take some things off of your to-do list and you just get still. You let God fully start to integrate and align the will with the mind with the body, with your relationships so that you are a fully integrated whole being and not joining the masses on planet earth who are walking around day in and day out with destroyed, ruined souls. As we get ready for that, hear just one more passage of scripture. You've been hearing from me. Hopefully it's all been from God. I pray he gets me out of the way. But this is like right from the heart of your Lord and Savior. Matthew 11. Are you tired? Worn out? Burned out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn, I love this next phrase, learn the unforced rhythms of grace. For I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. Doesn't that sound appealing? Commune with your God right now who loves you who's calling you out, who loves you so much that he wants to commune with you every day, yes, but one out of seven days, deeply, intimately, reverently. And hey, if you've fallen short, 
do business with God. I told you I didn't want to put you on a guilt trip tonight, but come on, let's be real. This is one of the Ten Commandments. If you need to say, God, I'm sorry, I've blown it, would you forgive me? I plead the blood of Jesus, would you forgive me? Would you restore this fractured relationship? As I commit this day to go forth from this place and not join the masses of ruined souls, but I'm going to start practicing soul Sabbath. I'm going to start redefining success through Sabbath rest. And God, I'm going to trust you to integrate, to align, to unify my life where my soul is deeply, deeply satisfied. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.